pleasure to welcome all of you to the 2019 Richard W. Smith Lecture in Civil War History. Whether we go back to ancient times or to the beginning of the modern uni university in medieval Europe or fast forward to the times in which we live, the fundamental relationship, the defining relationship on the campus of a university is the relationship between teacher and student. It's the teacher's knowledge of the discipline. It's the teacher's passion for the subject that ignites the intellectual curiosity of the student and that often sparks within the student a desire to learn more and to take that which is learned and put it to work in a life that is rich and meaningful and fulfilling. And on the other side, it is the student's evolving interest in and passion for the discipline. It is the student's remarkable growth that happens in the presence of the teacher that is the ultimate source of reward and fulfillment in the vocation of teaching. This lectureship grows out of the intersection of the relationships between teacher and student. In this case, the teacher was Dick Smith. And the students were legion. They came to this campus over several decades and one by one found their way into his classroom and in particular, through his passion and his knowledge, into a deep interest in the study of the Civil War. As I've gotten to know some of those students through the years that I've been at Ohio Wesleyan, I've listened to them, some of them who have devoted their lives to the academy and have become scholars and have talked about how Dick Smith inspired them to choose the vocation they chose. Others of whom went into business, but who regularly as leaders in business drew upon the lessons they learned in Dick's classroom. The lessons of individual generals or individual soldiers, of individual moments within that great war. And they found in those lessons, the lessons that they needed to achieve success in the businesses which they led. And so a few years ago, a group of those former students came together with the vision to endow this lectureship so that in perpetuity, this campus would have the opportunity to come together to hear one of the truly great scholars of the Civil War reflect in a fresh and new way on that epic time in our history. Many of you were students of Dick Smith. I'd like to ask all who were students of Dick Smith to stand so we can just see, those of us who were not, how many are here. And I can tell you that those who are standing have come from a half a dozen or more states to be here a part of this evening. Thank you so very much. And now I'd like to... I've lost sight of the good professor himself. Is Dick, he, he, will, he will be along in due time. Um, here he is, his dramatic entrance. Well, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you this evening as we uh, renew this lecture series and in particular this evening as we ha have the opportunity to hear from one of Dick's own students um, and one of Ohio Wesleyan's own graduates. And to introduce our speaker, I'd like to in introduce the chair of the Department of History, Dr. Barbara Tertian. Barbara? On behalf of the History Department, welcome. Thank you so much for attending this evening. And thank you all of you former student donors who have endowed this wonderful lecture series. It's been 18 years, I think, um, and so we've been able to bring nationally known, internationally known Civil War historians to this campus every year in honor of Dick Smith as, as, um, as an honor that his former students felt was appropriate. It's been fantastic. I will tell you that I'm not quite the groupie I was 18 years ago when this first happened, where I looked adoringly at um, all of the famous Civil War historians who are coming. Now I look nicely, but not quite as, as you know, in grasp of 
uh, what, how fantastic it was that I had read a book that they had written and here they were coming to campus. To me, that is still a thrill. So I'm glad that Rock had the opportunity to introduce Dick to you. I, I wanted to do that as well. So let me talk though instead about Joe Gladauer, Professor Dr. Joseph Gladauer, who was in 1978 in, in trimester, spring trimester at Ohio Wesleyan, a senior about to graduate. He was a history major and he had looked forward to taking the Civil War class that Dick Smith taught. It was such a heavily enrolled class that really you had to get senior status before you could actually take the class. So he took the class and he told me that that was the moment that he knew he wanted to go to graduate school, he wanted to be a Civil War historian, and he had written an honors thesis with Dick about Grant at Vicksburg. My Civil War students who are here, he wrote a primary source honors thesis in 1978 about Grant's campaign at Vicksburg. Nothing but primary sources. And trust me, back then you could not go on the computer and go, primary sources, Vicksburg. There was no such possibility of doing that. So it was too late for him to apply to graduate school for the next year, so he knew he was going to be taking off a year. But he knew that that was what he wanted to do. And so a year later, he enrolled at Rice University to get his master's, and then went on to Wisconsin to get his PhD. And I would say that his scholarship, you can see tonight what, we're, what, what he's going to talk about, generalship and army culture. I would say that his scholarship has been, he might not say this, but bottom up, in the sense that he has extensively studied the ordinary soldier in these armies. And so he's finally ready, having done that bottom up, knowing the culture of it, he's finally ready to tell us, well, how did Grant and how did Lee think about their armies? Did these soldiers get to push back against the generals or not? How much was Lee in control of that famous Army of Northern Virginia? But I'm going to let you tell, I'm going to let Joe tell that to you. So thank you very much for coming back to campus. Joe, one other thing I wanted to say, though, I want to say our colleague in the history department, Ellen Arnold, gets credit for imagining the Sagan National Colloquium this fall to be bringing back alums. And so some of the alums who have come back will tell you that I learned to think critically, read critically, analyze. But then I went off and did something that had nothing to do with my major. Joe is an example of somebody who learned to think critically, write critically, communicate well, but his major, his history major, he then became the ultimate that one can be in that field, a nationally recognized, internationally recognized scholar of the Civil War. So please join me in welcoming Professor Joe Gladauer. Oh, well, I love the 78. Woo! Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> You're great. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rock and Melissa, alums, students, and of course, Dick and Betty Smith. It's always a thrill to be back here at Ohio Wesleyan. When I did my research for my honors thesis, we had to use stone tablets because they hadn't invented print yet. You guys can't imagine life without computers, but we, we recall, I mean, writing out by hand and then typing on an electric typewriter. Or manual. Yep. All right. Let me talk to you tonight about generalship and army culture. Before I get started, I need to give you a few definitions. I'm sorry, this is painful, but we've got to lay them out there. So first, by culture, I mean a set of shared beliefs, understandings, and behaviors that evo have evolved to promote belonging, achievement, and survival in the world. Every organization has a culture. Culture appears in intangible forms, such as values and beliefs, and other times it appears in visible, sometimes material forms, such as ritual symbols and objects. Its vines wrap around the very fibers of the human condition, 
and it acts as a kind of filter for our understanding of the world around us. Individuals are affected by culture, and when they come together into groups, institutions, and organizations, they form a culture all their own. In fact, within an organization, each level has its own culture. The background of the people, the organization's mission, tr the training, the actual work experience, and leadership affect that culture. But because each level is part of a larger organism, it usually shares cultural aspects with levels above and below. And as individuals rise in the organization, they become more detached from the lower levels and get absorbed in their higher levels. Now, not everyone embraces culture. We've all been around organizations and seen that very thing. But most people do embrace the culture. And once it takes hold, it is exceedingly difficult to change culture. In the armed forces, the levels of culture are well established by the organization, the rank, and the, and the uh, responsibilities. But not everybody in the military embraces the culture. So we have the obvious lone wolf syndrome, the individuals who are out on their own and don't get absorbed in the culture. Other people reject the culture outright, then there are others who are rejected by the culture because they haven't performed well and they become isolated from the group. So one of the critical elements of that culture is a kind of trust for those people who are involved in the culture. The armed forces, like other institutions and organizations, reflects the society from which its personnel come. People enter the military service from society and their lives mirror much of the culture, values, and practices in their locality and their generation. And when the, when the tour of duty is over, they're going to go back to the civilian world and resume that culture. In the regular armed forces, this greater cultural continuity because you have staggered enlistments, career personnel, and holdovers from previous years that help preserve the existing culture, even in the face of leadership changes and new experiences such as combat. Yet military organizations in wartime that require a huge inflow of civilians are very different. The military has tries to instill cultural values in their people, but even Boot camp cannot purge many of the cultural values that individuals bring in from the civilian world. That's especially true in democratic republics. Most officers share the same cultural traits as their enlisted personnel because they come from the same society and they have the same values and same, same backgrounds and so on. The tra training and regimentation are certainly factors that affect the formation of the culture, but pre-war background and actual military experiences were much more powerful forces in shaping culture. Thus, it's a great challenge for senior leadership to build or alter an organizational culture th so that it will best serve the war effort. The culture of the, of the two armies I'm talking about, the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia and the, Army of the Union Army of the Potomac, were distinct. What dictated the development of those cultures was the background of the soldiers, the training and regimentation that officers imposed, particularly early in the war, and their formative experiences in combat and on the march. Once that culture took hold, it was extremely hard to break or alter. And I will argue today that it had a dramatic impact on the outcome of the Civil War. So tonight I want to explore those two very different cultures. And they reflect very much the predominant elements of each of their societies. In both instances, leaders struggled with that army culture with very important results that had major repercussions. The very first wave of volunteers for the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, 1861, you had a rush early before the fighting began. Companies and regiments poured into Richmond. 
where they were assembled into, into regiments and brigades and divisions. And so there, it's a very much haphazard process. The background of the soldiers I've just put up, for these are for the 1861 recruits. Then later, after the Battle of First Manassas in, in midsummer of 61, you saw another huge influx of volunteers. And so 46 percent, or I'm sorry, 49 percent of er all the soldiers who ever served in the Army of Northern Virginia enlisted in 1861. Median birth year, 1838, that means they were 22 or 23 when they enlisted. Half of them were farmers. Boy, you know how to read. <laughs> Notice median personal and family wealth, because I want to point that out later on when we compare it to the Union soldiers. But most importantly, personal and family slave ownership, 35%. It, the, the statistic for the South in the 1860 census is 19.9%. So what you have is a gross over-representation of people from slaveholding families. And then, of course, lived in a slaveholding household, 44%. In the, in the 1860 census, it would be 25%. So slaveholding is heavily over-represented in Lee's army in that very first year. Southern whites viewed slave ownership as one of the critical civil rights that the Constitution secured for them. A Virginia private enlisted so that, quote, we may be permitted to have our own form of government and our own social institutions and regulate our own domestic affairs, end quote. What do you think they're talking about when they say domestic affairs? Talking about slavery. Along similar lines, another enlistee recorded that he was willing to suffer, quote, any and every hardship rather than submit to abolitionists who are invading our soil, seeking to destroy that which our forefathers gained for us liberty. Thus, slave ownership was intrinsically bound with their perceptions of freedom, which seems absurd, but it was. At the core, virtually all these citizen soldiers shared the same fundamental beliefs in the rightness of secession and slavery. From society, they inherited Southern honor, an overarching concept that embraced powerful perceptions of manhood, integrity, independence, valor, kinship, esteem, and aggressiveness. These people, these volunteers were extremely aggressive and they sought to take war to the enemy and punish the Union people and the Union armies. But Southern society also promoted certain qualities that did not benefit the Confederate nation in a war against the better resourced Union. A lack of discipline, and particularly among the well-to-do, a spirit of profligacy and self-indulgence were acceptable modes of behavior before the war. Closely related to one another, these three behaviors elevated the individual over the group and tolerated conduct in uniform that was not conducive to effective military behavior. Southerners, particularly males, aspired to fulfill their every impulse and desire, and society tolerated and encouraged these indulgences. Attention to administrative detail and other mundane matters were beneath them. Undisciplined conduct and open expression of passion or ready resort to violence was not necessarily considered unbecoming in the pre-war South. After all, to adhere to a code of discipline meant that, that others imposed their will on the individual. Such dominance of the individual smacked of slavery, and Southern whites were extremely sensitive to it. Even in the realm of laws and codes of moral conduct, Southern males abided by them voluntarily, not out of compulsion. If society compelled them to obey, then it dominated the individual and deprived him of his manhood, and no self-respecting white Southerner could endure that. Southerners were convinced that their society produced better men than, and soldiers than Northerners. Quote, there is not a man in the Southern army who do, does not in his heart believe that he can whip three Yankees. He would consider it beneath his manhood to count upon whipping a less number in any sort of fight, a Virginian wrote home. Then he concluded, how they can ever hope to subdue us is beyond my comprehension. 
those who joined in 1862. reinforce those critical characteristics. Pay attention to this. The median wealth is up. Married is up. 66% farmers. Two of every three is a farmer. That's going to become important because farmers are, in, are individual workers. So that means that they're relying on their own ability. They have a better sense of independence. Personal and family slave ownership up to 42% and lived in slaveholding households, almost half of them, the enlistees in 1862, lived in a slaveholding household. So this bond to the institution of slavery is actually reinforced in the 1862 class, but the reinforcement is exactly in the same areas that the 1861 soldiers claimed. In addition, Look at the officer background for Lee's army. Median birth year, you would expect the officers to be a little older than the, than the enlisted men. Half are farmers, 15%, a little, uh, a little more than one in every seven is a professional. 38% married. Look at the median personal wealth is $3,000, but look at personal and family slave ownership, half. Lived in slave holding households, 63%. Isn't that incredible? Those are really powerful statistics. Most of the officers came from southern communities and commanded neighbors, friends, and family. They might have been richer, richer than their neighbors, but they were from the same communities. They reflected the values of that society, and most of them had learned to soldier right alongside their men. Originally, these guys were elected by their soldiers. Then the Confederacy underwent uh, a change in, 18, in April of 1862, the Confederate government passed a conscription law which enabled the regiments to reconstitute themselves and elect new officers. But from that point on, promotion was from within and they could only elect the bottom rung officer for the remainder of the war. So that was the, their last time that they could choose those people. The aggressive spirit of the officers and men blended well with President Jefferson Davis's military strategy, which was to punish invading Union armies as close to the border as possible. Because as Union armies penetrated the Confederacy, you're overrunning your own citizens. And so you've got an obligation to protect your own citizens. And furthermore, as they get overrun, you lose control of their farms, you lose control of whatever they produce. So you want to fight vigorously and as close to the border as possible as possible. Davis knew that the Union had vastly more resources, but he thought if we punished Union invaders so hard, the Union would get discouraged and give up the war. And so that fell in right in line with the aggressive spirit of his Southern soldiers. The first Army commander was this man, Joseph E. Johnston. Johnston placed little stock in the argument that elevated one society over the other. Instead, he perceived rebel superiority, quote, due solely to the spirit with which they fight, a spirit excited by patriotism and consciousness of the magnitude of the stake, end quote. Yet he undercut his own argument by stating to Davis that Southerners were better marksmen than Northerners. It is one of our great advantages over the northern people, he wrote. He also admitted that his soldiers had shown tremendous courage in the Battle of First Manassas. After all, honor demanded it. But he, also, but he conceded that they lacked discipline. The victory at First Manassas, quote, disorganized our volunteers as utterly as a defeat would do in an army of regulars, end quote. They had fought aggressively, had carried the day, and then, quote, everybody Officers and privates seemed to think that he had fulfilled all his obligations to the country and that before attending to any further call of duty, it was his privilege to look after friends, procure trophies, or amuse himself. Both he and his second-in-command, PGT Beauregard, believed this, quote, this trait in volunteer character gives us great anxiety, end quote. Unfortunately, Johnston's very own directives challenged the aggressive spirit and undercut his desire for greater discipline. Three times, Johnston ordered a retreat which exposed Confederate civilians. 
and resulted in the destruction of Confederate property as they fell back. In the worst case, Johnson's army fell back from the Manassas Centerville axis that's up just south of Washington, D.C. in March 1862 without Union duress, without Davis's knowledge, and amid a massive destruction of military and private property. More than 1.5 million pounds of meat were destroyed or spoiled. That is a lot of chow. <laughs> Along with large quantities of grain, a meat curing plant, a huge bakery that produced enough bread on a regular basis to feed every soldier in, Lee's, in the Confederate Army, and on top of that, quote, much more than half the regimental property was left and burned, Johnson admitted. The destruction sent a message to the troops that a disregard and, care and carelessness of government equipment and supplies was acceptable behavior. On May 31st, 1862, Johnston suffered a severe wound on the outskirts of Ri Richmond. Davis replaced him with Robert E. Lee. Lee shook things up right away. He called on officers and men to be vigilant in their efforts to conserve valuable material, especially ammunition, because of the Confederates' limited supply. He was, quote, firmly convinced that our success is mainly dependent upon the economical and proper appropriation of public property at all times. The Confederacy had very little margin for error, and Lee knew it. And then Lee tapped Confederate aggressiveness, as he described it, valor, fortitude, and boldness, and launched a massive attack. Although he, he had trouble coordinating his forces, he drove, drove the Yankees back 20 miles from Richmond, and then within a short period of time, he regrouped, advanced to northern Virginia, defeated the Federals, and invaded Pennsylvania. So in a little over two months, Lee turned the war effort around. Eventually, he was, able to, he was required to fall back from Maryland, but his, he and his army emerged as great heroes of the Confederacy. Despite the resounding success, Lee fully recognized the scope of the problem he was confronting. He had to break the cultural pattern that had taken deep root in the army. In a revealing letter to the president just days after entering Maryland, Lee admitted that the army suffered from a severe discipline problem that stemmed from a combination of the way the Confederacy organized its units its premature introduction into combat without adequate training or regimentation, and a series of harsh conditions, hard marches, and frequent campaigns and battles. He believed, quote, the material of which it is composed is the best in the world, and nothing can surpass the gallantry and intelligence of the main body. But there are individuals who, from their backwardness and duty, tardiness of movement, and neglect of orders, do it no credit, end quote. Less than a week after he fell back from Antietam, Lee informed Major General James Longstreet and Major General Thomas Stonewall Jackson, his two wing commanders, that they must alter army culture. He urged them to, quote, infuse a different spirit among our officers and to inspire them in making every necessary effort to bring about a better state of discipline, end quote. They must, quote, impress men and officers with the importance of a change necessary to the preservation of this army and its successful accomplishment of its mission. As its better discipline, greater mobility, and higher inspirations must counterbalance the many advantages over us, both in numbers and material, which the enemy possess, end quote. The problem Lee confronted was that the military culture had settled in and he could not break it. Heavy casualties resulted, but the replacements came from the civilian world and they infused the army with that same culture. Over, th over the three months from the opening salvos of the Seven Days Battles, Lee's first campaign, which is in June of 62, until the first shot at Antietam, mid-September 1862, over 30% of the division commanders, only 30% of the division commanders still commanded the divisions, and almost four of every 10 brigade commanders had changed. For the entire war, almost a quarter of all the officers who ever served in Lee's army were killed in action, and more than half the officers were either killed in action or wounded at least one time. 
From seven days through mid-summer 1864, 1,600 officers were killed in action and 6,000 officers were wounded in action. In most cases, replacements were no better at disciplining the troops. Quote, what our officers most lack is the pains and labor of inculcating discipline, Lee complained to the president in mid-August 1864. It is a painful and tedious process and is not apt to win popular favor. Many officers have too many selfish views to promote to induce them to undertake the task of instructing and disciplining their commands. Oh, oops, sorry, there's the man. I forgot to put him up there. Lee believed his enlisted men, uh, Lee believed his enlisted men lacked discipline and officers could not instill it because they themselves lacked discipline. As you can see, the statistics are pretty chilling, officers and men, and you see, see how hard it really was. Keep in mind, the Army of Northern Virginia was the only truly successful institution in the Confederate States of America. And as the war, won, were, uh, as the war continued on, the soldiers assumed greater and greater burdens under rapidly diminishing resources. The grind and casualties and hardships became more than many of them could endure. Li they lived on 1,200 calories for the last six months of the war, or seven months of the war. Anyone know what the U.S. Army feeds its military people in combat zones to maintain body mass and, and weight? 4,000 calories. I mean, this is a slow starvation diet. Living on 1,200 calories per day, the dash was gone, the aggressive spirit dissipated, as rebel soldiers asked themselves the critical question about Southern honor. Is my primary responsibility to my family, or is it to my fledgling country? In February and March 1865, Lee's army endured an average of 120 desertions per day. They obviously answered that question. Confederate soldiers possessed a confidence in their military prowess at, that they derived from Southern culture, and those troops exhibited a level of, of aggressiveness that often carried the day. Officers who were products of that same culture led and fought their men audaciously, often compensating for tactical errors and insufficient or in, inadequate supplies, equipment, and numbers. On the battlefield, Lee's army killed approximately 40% of all Union soldiers who were killed in action and wounded over 50% of all Union soldiers wounded in action. As a consequence, some 30,000 of Lee's men were killed in action and 125,000 were wounded in action. Try as he might, Lee never seemed to combat Southern culture and the baggage it brought. Confederates came from a society that cherished honor and encouraged independence and independent-mindedness. They did not take orders or discipline well and often did what they wanted, not what their officers directed. Efforts to discipline the soldiers failed because the officers, even some of them West Pointers, came from the same society and shared many of the same values as their men. By the time Lee took command in June of 1862, that army culture had already set firmly. Lee tried to crack it, but without the full and constant support of vigilant officers, he merely chipped away at the edges. In a war against an enemy with vastly superior manpower and resources, his inability to alter it prevented his army from exploiting its limited resources fully and hurt the war effort. Now let's look at the Army of the Potomac. Soldiers of 1861. Notice the dramatic difference. Roughly 60% were skilled or unskilled workers who enlisted in 1861. Look at the personal and family wealth, $200. Do you remember what it was for Confederates of 1861? $1,200. This is straight from the US Census records, people. So you see a dramatic difference. 
the composition and culture of the Union Army of the Potomac was, was incredible. With a median total personal family wealth of $200, it appears on the surface to be much more of a rich man's war and a poor man's fight, doesn't it? But the truth of the matter is, if you, when you examine the statistics, they are precisely representative of people in the same age bracket and, fa and families from those same states as, as their own. So in other words, say the age range was 17 to 45, if we took all males from, North Carol from uh, New York between 17 and 45 and crunched the numbers, the median wealth would be two, roughly $200. So the North is much poorer, and these guys are actually representative of their, of their community. Pay for privates amounted to $156 per year plus food and $36 a year for clothing allotment. That's for privates. While that pay may seem low, keep in mind that four of every nine families, 43.5% of the soldiers in the Army of the Potomac who enlisted in 1861, had a total family wealth of $150 or less. So clearly there's a financial incentive for, for going to military service, but it's way more complicated than just money. After all, I'm an academic. I didn't go into this to get rich. Did I? <laughs> in an examination of the counties from which the soldiers came, the average vote for Lincoln in 1860 was 53.9%. That's compared to their home states in which the vote was 46.8%. So you have much heavier support for Lincoln in their counties. We can't determine what their vote is. Furthermore, uh, almost half the soldiers in the Army of the Potomac who ever served could not vote in 1860. They were too young. By 1864, the average vote for Lincoln was up to 55.1%. Thus, in their home counties, there was strong, a strong presence and a bond to the Republican Party. And as Eric Foner has taught us clearly, the one common unifying theme among Republicans was a dislike of slavery. Northern Democrats in 1860 had grafted egalitarian concepts for white men from the age of Jefferson and Jackson onto a conservative platform that opposed concentration of corporate banking and governmental power so that individuals could succeed economically, in effect, get out of the way of the citizens. The Union not only protected their rights, but could shield citizens from the concentrated power of banks and corporations. Hence, Democrats supported the war to a great extent. Unlike Lee's army, foreign soldiers constituted almost three in every 10 men in the, arm, in the Army of the Potomac. Migrants, by nature, are risk takers. It takes a lot of courage to go to a foreign country, many of whom didn't speak the language and start anew. So for them, going to military service is not such a giant leap. More importantly, they came from lands where they were trapped economically and they had no voice in their own government. In some states, immigrants could vote legally in two years, and in some urban areas, many vo Ill voted illegally as non-citizens. In their home country, they believed they would never have a chance to choose those who govern them. In the U.S., they earned that right relatively quickly, elevating them to an unusual status. It was the Union that gave them that opportunity. This is my country as much as the man who was born here, an Irish immigrant justified to his wife. Despite anti-immigrant know-nothing the anti-immigrant know-nothing party, they had fled their native land for rights and economic opportunity, and in the U.S., they were fining them. So it's a really, really powerful, powerful situation. Thus, Republicans or Democrats, native-born or immigrants, they had a genuine interest in preserving the Union because liberty and success went hand in hand. 
Many were not willing to go to war over slavery in 1861 or 1862. They joined the army to preserve the Union. But in time, they came to realize what Abraham Lincoln had articulated in 1862, that slavery was a resource that aided the Confederacy, and the Union had to eliminate slavery to assist its war effort, and also to ensure that if and when the Union won, the issue would, re would be removed permanently from the public debate. As one soldier wrote, the war will last as long as slavery lasts. There will be no war without slavery and no peace with it. By contrast, soldiers in the Army of the Potomac had distinct backgrounds and wartime experiences. As a result, the Army culture that developed was very different. Even though two of every three farms in the United States in 1860 was in the northern states, as you can see, a very small percentage of these soldiers were either farmers or farmhands. And that results in a very different type of individual. Unskilled workers are working in groups. They're, they're accustomed to cooperating with one another. Skilled workers are constantly interacting with other people. That makes them very different from farmers who are virtually isolated. Other than their family members, they're isolated to, for a great percentage of the time. When we look at the Army as a whole, here I'll give, show you the 1862 statistics, and as you can see, there's just not that much change. This is almost identical. They're slightly wealthier. A slightly, uh, marriage is about roughly the same. Farmer percentage, roughly the same. Skilled and unskilled, about the same. One year difference in age. The 1862 crop is just like the 1861 crop. I mean, it's all within a margin for error, certainly. So you realize what we're talking about. We're talking about three of every five of them was a skilled or unskilled worker. Very different type of individual you're bringing in. And the culture that emerged in the Army of the Potomac very much represented that. Keep in mind that when you are working as a skilled or unskilled worker, you have to be disciplined because you're out on your own. You have to show up at a certain time. You have to work for a certain number of hours. Then you get released. I mean, it's very structured. Agriculture is a much less structured occupation. And so they fit in really well in that military system. Now, this isn't a disciplined army like the Prussians or Europeans would, would say, but it's certainly a much more disciplined and structured army than the Confederates had. For all Major General George B. McClellan's faults as a combat commander, he drilled, instructed, and disciplined his troops, building them into an effective military machine. As the army gained strength after First Manassas when he took over, McClellan was able to meld newcomers into the fold, relying on a handful of regular army batteries and regiments as the backbone. The drills and martial parades forged an esprit de corps and resonated with aspects of their pre-war background. Rather than see themselves as individuals, they viewed themselves as part of a larger team. McClellan made them feel like soldiers. Now, if we look at the Army of the Potomac, you see a huge number of people pass through. I would estimate 350,000 pass through the Army of the Potomac. What's unusual is that one in every four serve for enlistment terms of two years or less. So you have a pretty rapid turnover in addition to casualties. Whereas you look at the, if you were enlisted in 1861 in Lee's army, you were in there for the duration. My father told me that that was his biggest fear in World War II. He was a Marine in the Pacific. You're in for the duration. If the war goes for 10 years, I'm still in the Marine Corps. <laughs> Anyway, I'll, I'll get off that hobby horse, right? <laughs> What's also interesting is almost one in every four who ever served in the Army of the Potomac entered the Army in 1864 or 1865. So you have a huge influx of personnel late in the war, and these are in, obviously inexperienced personnel. To make matters worse, of those who served in 1864-65 campaigns, only one in every 12 was a veteran volunteer. That is, they had served three years or had enlisted for three years and they had re-enlisted for another three-year term. One in every 12. 
and make, to make it even worse, only one in every 24 was an infantryman. To put it in context, Sherman's army that marched the sea, almost 50% veteran volunteers. Thus, they sustained heavy losses, endured incompetent generals, as we'll talk about in a moment, and other, and other officers, and suffered through defeat after defeat. Yet their faith in the army remained among most of the troops because they absorbed the new people, and the new people were just like them. They had great faith in their comrades and placed the blame on military and political leaders and believed that with the right commander, they could whip Lee's army. Here's the, some officer background, just so you see. They're very different from their enlisted men. Look, 1% unskilled, 26% skilled. That's well less than half the enlisted population. Ninety-nine percent of all officers who ever served in the Army of the Potomac enlisted in 1861 or 1862. Ninety-nine percent. Essentially, the only ones who didn't were, say, doctors or chaplains who came in at a later date. Unlike the Army in Northern Virginia, where officers were expected to lead from the front, these officers followed the manual in which they were supposed to lead slightly behind the front. And as a result, their combat losses were much less. 34.9% were killed or wounded compared to the Confederates, well over 50%. Unfortunately, the upper echelon of the Army was highly politicized. Regular and ex-regular army officers were overwhelmingly conservative. The army is a conservative institution. It perceives itself as the bulwark against anarchy, invasion, and change to a great extent. And as a result, it tends to attract people who are more conservative for a career. And that was no different in the 19th century. So they're overwhelmingly conservative. They had a great difficulty accepting Link the Lincoln administration's approach to the war, especially regarding slavery and the destruction of property. George B. McClellan and his successor, Ambrose Burnside, were strong Democrats. When Burnside accepted the position to replace McClellan, he only did so because if he didn't do it, they were going to give it to Joseph Hooker and and everybody, and those two hated Hooker and thought he was a radical. And then, of course, when Hooker was, Hooker got it after Burnside, and after Hooker was replaced, George Meade stepped in. Meade had strong family ties to the Whig Party. His father-in-law was Henry Clay's vice presidential candidate. Did you know that, Dick? <laughs> that might be the only thing Dick didn't know. <laughs> Did you know it? He's sheepish, so he might not have. He didn't hear it? Okay, did you know that Burnside's father-in-law was Henry Clay's running mate? Yeah. Yes, he did. <laughs> I thought I might stump him one time. You, you'd think after all these years, I'd be able to get him once. I know, you're right. Don't even try. I'm a lost cause. What can I say? So what you see is, is a lot of tension. Burnside, I mean, me, fortunately, tried to stay out of politics as much as he could, which was a really smart decision. But remember, Hooker's the guy who told Lincoln what we really needed is a dictator. And Lincoln responded, you go out and win a victory and I'll risk the dictatorship. <laughs> he didn't do it. He, he, didn't, he didn't have to risk the dic dictatorship because Hooker didn't win. Now, the original Union strategy was devised by Winfield Scott, the Anaconda Plan. What he wanted to do was blockade the Confederate ports, train large army forces, see, send them down the Mississippi and sever the 
the Confederacy and then send large forces into the Confederacy via various river networks so you can draw supplies from the Union Army by water. Sensible approach. He didn't want monumental battles because he was fearful if we spilled a lot of blood, it would be really difficult to reintegrate the South after the war, which proved to be exactly so. And that's where they came up with the concept, Anaconda Plan, the media slowly squeezing the, the life out of the Confederacy. <coughs> Scott's successors and the commanding officers of the Army of the Potomac tried various means to get at Confederate armies and to capture critical centers like Richmond. But Confederate commanders, Robert E. Lee in particular, slowed their advance and hammered them back and even seized the initiative and launched raids into, into Maryland and then the next year, Pennsylvania. Battle after battle in the East, the Confederate forces under Robert E. Lee resisted skillfully, whipping the Yankees time and again. Men in the Union Army of the Potomac had fought hard and well, but leadership at the top failed them time after time after time. McClellan failed, as one soldier chided, you know, quote, you know I have not thought very highly of the generalship of General McClellan from the date of the Battle of Williamsburg, that's his first battle, up to the present date, and I hope I may not be disappointed in the new commanders of the Army of the Potomac, Generals Burnside and Hooker. Sure I am that when a battle takes place, there will be, they will be there to see. He's chiding McClellan because McClellan stayed in the rear in the Seven Days Battles handling supplies when, and he left the battle to his subordinates and didn't coordinate, which the soldiers knew. There's, there's Georgie. There's Ambrose Burnside. See the, see the uh, sideburns? That's where we get sideburns from. Students, you knew that though, didn't you? Okay, you told them that, didn't you? Yes, yeah, she did. <laughs> so when McClellan failed to advance after the, after the Battle of Antietam in September of 62, he was replaced in November of 62, Lincoln put in Ambrose P. Burnside. Before long, Burnside was repulsed at Fredericksburg, December of 62, and then in January of 63, the army got bogged down in the infamous mud march in which the army became mired in mud and Confederates, so wrote a Union soldier, quote, placed a board across the river just opposite us with the following on it in large letters, Burnside's army stuck in the mud. It was too true, he wrote, end quote. Hooker replaced Burnside and Hooker buoyed morale and with food, supplies, discipline, and even core badges. But like McClellan, when it came to time to fight, he failed. Meanwhile, soldiers began to see themselves as political tools. That's quote unquote by one soldier. And he said the officers and men had become quote, disheartened, discouraged, demoralized, end quote. His replacement was George Meade, who commanded at the site of the first true Union victory at Gettysburg. Generally, troops respected Meade because unlike his predecessors, he didn't play political games, and his command did repulse the Confederates at Gettysburg, inflicting heavy casualties. But he failed to follow up on the success, stripping the luster off the victory. Quote, the prisoners that come in this morning say we might have took their whole army just as well as not, grumbled a veteran. It is just as I expected. Meade was very afraid of a little rain and laid over 24 hours too long, and they slipped away from him. Every soldier is growling about it because we might as well had him as not, and they will now march us like lightning to catch him, but shit, let it go, end quote. Another federal soldier summarized it even more aptly when he wrote, our army is an anomaly. It is an army of lions commanded by jackasses, <laughs> end quote. So you get, see that, how frustrated they are with their army leadership. To, finally, to oversee all Union armies in early 1864, of course, Lincoln brought Ulysses S. Grant, the victor out west of Forts Henry and Donaldson in Chattanooga, uh, and Vicksburg, 
back east, forgot Vicksburg, and we rode on it. Grant proposed an, alter an alternative strategy, but the, uh, the Lincoln administration rejected that. He wanted to launch a raid and destroy railroads and infrastructure and so on. But they wanted him to fight directly against Lee's army. He, they wanted him to target Lee's army. So Lincoln, Secretary of War, Stanton, and Halleck were in agreement that the target should be Lee's army, but that, as Grant well knew, would result in staggering this hooker. There's a myth about hooker and prostitutes. But that's actually not true. The word hooker was used previous to the Civil War. But it's a great story, isn't it? Sometimes stories are so great that they should be true. There's Meade. There's Ulysses. He's the man. So Grant had to adopt their approach. But what none of the, them anticipated was that the Lincoln, Stanton, Halleck approach played to the strength of the Army of the Potomac and its culture. That tough, disciplined fighting force had grown frustrated with the leadership of the army. They wanted a commander who would fight it out with Lee's army, one who would not fall back, who would keep coming forward. They had endured staggering losses in defeat. The soldiers knew the direct approach would result most likely in terrible losses once again, and it might very well cost them their own lives. But this time, the casualties would not be in vain. They would endure the suffering for victory. Grant learned a valuable lesson in the aftermath of the Battle of the Wilderness as the Federal Army marched away from the battlefield to the south and east. Soldiers began to cheer. With Grant at the helm, there would be no operational re retreat. Despite the hardships and, quote, a very tiresome campaign, end quote, one soldier admitted in late June 1864, quote, all have the utmost confidence in Grant. The army is in good spirits. And they had suffered staggering losses, but they knew they were winning the war all of a sudden. Despite the outcome of the battles of, in 1864, the casualties and other hardships proved disastrous to the Confederate army. When the Union lost men, it replaced them. When the Confederacy lost men, it often did without or could not do so on an equal basis. A telltale sign of the burdens of those losses were statistics on dead, wounded, and prisoners of war. The Confederate battle losses totaled 63.7% of all men who ever served in Lee's army. That's 63%, 64% were either killed, wounded at least once, or captured. And some, of course, were wounded and then captured. Others were wounded and killed. We're talking about different individuals. By con comparison, 37.7% of all Federals. Throughout the entire war, approximately 30,000 men in the Army of Northern Virginia were killed in action. The Army of the Potomac had, it's hard to tell because the Army of the Union calculated killed in action differently. If you were mortally wounded, you were considered wounded. So uh, roughly 30,000 in the Army of the Potomac were, kill, were killed or mortally wounded. The re re rebel army sustained 67,000 men wounded in action and 64,000 captured prior to Appomattox. By comparison, troops in the Army of the Potomac had sustained about 70,000 wounded and just under 37,000 prisoners of war. So you see pretty demonstrative differences. Now war is a young person's undertaking. Recruits in the Army of Northern Virginia grew older and older, while reinforcements in the Army of the Potomac were younger and younger. Moreover, from October 63 through the end of the war, Lincoln called out 1,180,000 new troops. Nearly 25% of all soldiers who ever served in the Army of the Potomac entered in 64 and 65. By contrast, less than 5% of all soldiers who served in the Army of Northern Virginia entered in the same time period. By the end of 1864, the CSA had closed down the Conscript Bureau on its own recommendation. 
A study in 1864 of Virginia, by far the most populous state in the Confederacy, determined that only 2,719 white males would reach the age of 17 over the next 12 months. Ultimately, the Confederacy lost so many troops that the Union pushed them back farther, overrunning Confederate territory and depriving the rebels of the resources in that region. Under increased hardship and an inability to stem the Union advance, huge numbers of Confederates began to desert. In the end, Grant fought a war of attrition, not by design initially, but one nonetheless. The soldiers in the Army of Potomac accepted the approach because it was the surest way to victory. Focused, disciplined, and willing to endure great hardship for the causes, they endured losses, absorbed recruits, and maintained their culture. In their minds, they had sustained massive losses under other commanders without much progress. With Grant's army holding Lee's forces largely in place and inching their way around Lee's flanks in the Richmond-Petersburg area, they could finally see that victory was near at hand. In the end, that culture brought it victory. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, I'm going to ask a question and then. OK. So basically, you're saying that even though the war effort stalls that summer of 1864, that the morale of the Army of the Potomac was pretty good. Yes. Right? But what about northern public opinion by the, what I'm thinking of, Joe, is, and you know, you know, the idea that northern public opinion coming up in with the presidential election coming up in the fall and Lee and the Confederacy very much looking at that and hoping that a war Democrat on a peace, peace platform would win. And in August of 64, northern public opinion isn't so great, right? Yeah. The, the price of gold in comparison to, to um, greenbacks reached its worst level ever so that people were lo losing faith that the Union was going to win the war. Greenbacks, of course, are paper notes backed by the government. So you saw a rapid decline among investors. The public opinion was pretty much horrified by the staggering losses. The Democrats were outraged, especially the anti-war Democrats were outraged. But Lincoln held the course because he could see that Grant was moving in the right direction. He was getting the job done, and the soldiers stuck with him. And when you read their letters home, they keep saying that. They don't hearken about or, or focus on the loss of life so much as that they're making progress. And, and so it's, a, it's one of those dichotomies where the losses, losses affect home, the home front in horrible ways. Microphone. But so then Sherman, though, does take Atlanta before the election. Yeah. So, so how do you view that in terms of the... Well, I think Sherman's victory really convinces people that Grant's going to, that the Union's going to win the war. I mean, when Atlanta falls and shortly thereafter Sheridan crushes Early's army in the valley, that, that pretty much puts the Confederacy in a real bind. So I think at that point, it's clear that the Union is making enormous progress towards ultimate victory. And that's why Sherman's Atlanta campaign is so important. No one, oh, Kathy. You're not a chip off the old block, are you? I'm my father's daughter. <laughs> I always have something to ask. So I wondered about the West Pointers and the folks who were among the elite in terms of the you know, the, the graduates who went south and north and how that affected the culture because it sounds like their training must have been overrun by the culture within the Army of Northern Virginia. I think that's, I th actually I think the culture is affected in both armies. I mean the fortunate thing is that northern population is much, uh, at least in the east, is much more 
comfortable with a disciplined, regimented environment. When we talk about Sherman's Army, I, I'm doing my research on Sherman's Army right now because I think I'm going to do a book on these three things. And so I'm going through old muster rolls to find out who's with Sherman's Army in the 1864-65 campaign. So it'll take me a little while to calculate wealth and so on. But Sherman's Army is very different. It's a Western Army. They don't take to disciplining well. They have a clear sense of what they need to do. And the truth of the matter is that Sherman learns from his troops. He takes, follows their lead because he, he, he tr keeps fighting them and fighting them and fighting them. And they keep winning and they keep destroying things and crushing Southern morale. And he finally realizes these guys know more than I do about this stuff because they're just reacting out of frustration and out of, out, of, as a, out of a desire to win the war and end it as quickly as possible. So in that instance, it's a very different scenario. Uh, you know, the, the regulars are tough. They have very restricted views about military service, largely drawing from the European model. Let me break the news here. The United States isn't Europe. I mean, you look at even the East Coast. Somebody was telling, one of my graduate students was telling me the other day, in the 1870 census, they determined wooded areas, calculate wooded, wooded areas. In Virginia, 50% of the state was still in forests. And that's gonna be the smallest percentage of all the Confederate states. Well, maybe Texas, but that's because they don't have forest, much forest west of Houston. But, but that's a different issue. The truth of the matter is, it's a really shocking statistic that you know, most of the United States is heavily forested. You know the story, Dick, of course, taught us this when we were in, in his basic US history class. They could smell the pine trees from 60 miles out in the ocean when they were coming to North America because the, we're all forests. The eastern half of the United States was all forest. And that affected the way the soldiers responded. The eastern armies fought in very traditional fashion, following the tactics manuals that the Europeans did. The western soldiers are like, the hell with this. This is stupid. And even Grant, Grant and there's a great interview of Grant in about 1870s in the New York Times, and Grant makes, makes a joke out of it. Yeah, we, were, we thought we'd follow the manual, but that proved ridiculous because all we're doing is try following the manual when you're in dense woods. You can't do it. So Grant even admitted that it was ridiculous. Yes, sir. You, you want me, why don't I come down? You, I was very impressed with the uh, statistics you gave. I think it was 120 desertions. A, a day of the yes. When, Lee's when, Army. When the North was mismanaged, Miss, Miss General, prior to Grant, uh, what sort of statistics did the, of desertion did the North suffer? And then how did that change once Grant came? Uh, I, haven't, I haven't studied the desertion of the Army of the Potomac prior to and during Grant's tenure, so I can't answer it. But, you know, it's, uh, it's harder for, for Union soldiers to desert because you're in Confederate territory. Right. And so, you know, it's, it's just difficult to desert, whereas Confederates, this is your home, homeland. But still, desertion rates are high in the Union. But most, I found in my, I have a sample of the Army of the Potomac, and I, I probably actually do have desertion rates, come to think of it, and I can pull it up on the, my computer. But uh, a lot of the desertions are shortly after they enlist. In other words, they enlist and then they decide, I'm not doing this. And a lot of desertions in 64 and 65 because the unions really enforcing conscription. And so people who get conscripted, conscripted or take the bounty to serve and they really don't want to serve and they flee. Uh oh. Oh, I thought there's one back there. Go ahead. I'm, I'm in charge. I got the microphone. It's a power thing. 
I'm sorry, you have to boom and I can't hear you. Native Americans served in different capacities depending on their locations. For example, large numbers of North Carolinian Indians served in the Confederate Army. A fair number of Northern Indians served in the Union Army. And then, of course, you've got the, the, Cherokee, uh, the uh, Cherokee out in Oklahoma and others who served with the Confederacy. So it's, it's really a mixed bag. Generally, depends where you live. Okay? There are a number of books on that subject. It's worth taking a look at. Okay. Who has a question here? Yes, sir. Yeah, the question was, Lee was a Southerner from Virginia, so wouldn't he be a, have, have been influenced by that culture himself? I think Lee would have understood elements of that culture, but he was also a regular Army career officer, and so he's much more re regimented. Lee's also much more... Um, sensible about what he needs to do and, and, and how to go about it. Lee is a really smart guy, really smart. One time I came across a letter of Lee's at Duke Library and he used a word and I didn't in Latin and I wasn't sure what it, what it meant. So I asked the archivist and he said, well, I'm going to lunch with the head of the Latin department. So I'll photocopy it and go ask him. And when he came back from lunch, he told me, the head of the Latin department was really impressed. He said only somebody with an incredible knowledge of Latin would have used that word in that context. And I thought, <laughs> there's a reason Lee graduated number two. He's a smart cookie. So I think Lee saw the need, and, and in, you know, because he can detach himself more than maybe his soldiers. Yes. Oh, the question was, what was the Latin word? Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> that was years ago. Come on. Dick would remember. <laughs> Dick, did I tell you that? And did I tell you the word? No, I didn't. Yes, ma'am. I understood you to say that the northern soldiers were powerfully motivated to be against, because they were against slavery. And they're, they're Ultimately. Okay, I think that just... Yeah, initially, uh, they, I think they're of mixed opinions. Look. You may not like, there are lots of things in life I'm, I don't like, but I'm not going to go to war over them. Do you know what I mean? I'm not willing to risk my life for it. And I think that's what, the way a lot of the Union soldiers felt early in the war. But as they served, and some were abolitionists, but as they served for a longer period of time, they came to the realization, the central role of slavery, not only in aiding the Confederate war effort, but being the cause of the war. And they realized, we need, really need to destroy this institution. Uh, for many of them, it really wasn't until 63, 64, 65 that they came to that conclusion. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. Remember, many of them would, would have never seen slavery. If you grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, you would never have. If you grew up in Delaware, Ohio, you would never have seen slavery. You're not likely to have traveled to Cincinnati even. Because, you know, people were so localized. Yes, sir. Lee offered the command of the Union Army at the start of the war? Yes, he was. Lee was offered the un command of the Union Army, and he turned it down. And he said that Virginia was his Yes, yes. Virginia was his country. Well, he also had, you know, he had kids. He said he couldn't fight against his own children, own family. He had slaves, too. Uh, Lee's family owned slaves. I mean, technically, he owned them, but... He had to release them. Let me think. I think the end of 1863 by his father-in-law's will. Don't bet the house on that, but I think it was the end of 63. He had to release them. But yeah, Lee, technically, he owned slaves, yes. Anyone else? You guys are letting me off the hook. Wait, not so fast. <laughs>
As Professor Turgeon noted at the beginning of the event, tonight's um, Smith Lecture is co-hosted by the Sagan National Colloquium, and the theme this year has been returning alumni to campus to show the myriad different careers, interests, successes, and um, advice that the alumni have for current students. And so we've been posing at the end of all of the Sagan-related events the question of, there's a whole bunch of Ohio Wesleyan students here in the room, what advice would you give them in their time at college? Besides believe everything I said. Uh -huh. Besides believe Dr. Turgeon. Drink a lot of beer. No, don't do as I did, do as I say. I went to college, I weighed 155 pounds, I got out and I weighed 180. I also grew three inches, so. Yeah, that, help, that does help. I'm, I, you know, I, truth be told, I came to college and I was a little insecure intellectually. And I got comfort, a, a comfort level because it's Dr. Smith, and it's really hard to say, but I began to believe in myself. And that's what you should be extracting. You're formulating your own ideas, your own opinions. Think about this. Don't just be a rote memorizer. Read the materials and think about it. This is a time for intellectual growth. And for me, I kind of stumbled through it and finally caught on. But pay attention in your careers. You know, in my lifetime, I have found that just because you go to Harvard doesn't make you really that smart. And furthermore, the smartest people at, at Ohio Wesleyan are as smart as the smartest people anywhere in the world. I'm convinced of it. So, you know, exploit the opportunity. You have great faculty who are right at your disposal. You, they have office hours. You go in and you kick around ideas. I read this. What do you think? Also, pay attention to what you're getting in one field and see how you can transfer it to another field. I mean, I was so fortunate because I took a bunch of economics courses, political science courses, psychology courses. I saw one of my former professors Dr. Barrick is right here. He taught me statistics. I mean, the, and, and now look at what I do. I do statistics. So you, and, and I'm, the, I'm the historian who actually knows data. I'm the one. So it, it's just a different world. But you, get, you learn to transfer those ideas, those issues, those concepts, sociology, political science, economics, generally the social sciences, but you can also study history from the scientific perspective. And that's what you need to be sensitized to. You know, history is the study of human life. It's experience. And the experience could be something inconsequential, you know, what seemingly inconsequential in this area, or it could be something monumental in another. So history delves into every other subject matter in existence. That's why I find it so marvelous. I also find it marvelous because human beings aren't like math problems. <laughs> There's no one solution. You know, they act erratically. They act for all sorts of different reasons, all different motivations. Hey, Rob, I didn't see you there. This is my former undergraduate student. He's now a graduate student at Ohio State University. He's a first year graduate student. He's one of my favorite students of all time. Anyway, there are so many wonderful opportunities for you right here at Ohio Wesleyan. You have such great faculty and they're willing to put in time with you. Exploit it, exploit it. You know, you go to other schools. I mean, I go to my office hours, my colleagues do, and they pay, I pay attention, but students don't come. And that's a shame. Or they come when they have a problem. <laughs> so go with, into, with ideas, issues. Think about the materials that you're working on. That's one, one, I assume that other teachers have felt the same thing. One of the problems is students do the readings, but then they don't think about it. 
after they've done it. They shut the book and that's it, and they come into class and they haven't really thought about it since. You need to think about these things. One of my closest friends was a, a lawyer in the US Army. He was the chief legal advisor for all US forces in Europe. That's a pretty heady job, as you can imagine. And he told me every Friday morning, unless he, would, he refused to take any phone calls unless it was a family emergency or his boss called. Otherwise, no one was allowed to see him. And he would sit down and with a pad in front of him and think about problems and try and work, sketch out solutions. Because we don't have time. We don't take time to think through issues. And so do, do those sorts of things. Those, that's the kind of advice I'd give you. Does that help? No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I know what you're thinking. Old fart. He doesn't know anything. It's a great idea.